Hi everyone. Happy Saturday. And it is Saturday, November 22nd, 2014. And we are here today to learn about technology and autism, robots, assistive tools, and more. Our subtopics are we're going to explore some ideas from the field of engineering, specifically robotics, and the ideas of Dr. Dan Popa and his team from the University of Texas at Arlington Research Institute, UTARI. We're going to learn about assistive technology tools for the classroom, since we can't all purchase a robot of our own. Um, we'll learn about iPad compatible apps, tablet tools, et cetera. And then we'll wrap up with a discussion of a few books that we've been reading. Um, I've been reading Thinking in Pictures by Temple Grandin and Dr. Amber Brown will be sharing a bit more about the autistic brain by Temple Grandin. And we have resources for you. So before we get started, I'm sending through the webinar a file. And if you're watching the recording later, you should be able to get this file. And the link, um, the Google Doc, if it doesn't show up for some reason in the chat window, like if you're watching the video, just email one of us, Dr. Amber Brown or Dr. Peggy Simmingson, and we can send the file. And our contact information is, is somewhere in this document. So again, um, this is being recorded. The link is on our YouTube channel, UTA New Teachers, which we encourage you to visit or recommend to others. It's our archive. And again, the link to the Google Doc just shares those links so you can explore on your own. So this is a series of webinars. It's geared for new teachers, but it's also for all educators, whether you're training to be a new teacher or you already are an experienced or new teacher. These opinions are unique to the presenters in the series. They do not necessarily reflect the views of UT Arlington. We encourage you to comment in the chat window to ask questions. You can do emoticons as well. You can do the thumbs up symbol, which is um, under the participants window. You can ask questions. You, we really encourage you to make comments. If you have additional knowledge to share, you can type that in the chat window. And we would love to hear your thoughts and ideas so far. Um, so again, we do have ideas that you can look at later on our YouTube channel, as well as our SlideShare channel. It's just uh, slideshare.net slash UTA New Teachers. And we have a Facebook page for the department. Can everyone type in the chat window? And if you want to use the pen tool, you can put an X where you are right now. I'm thinking many of us are in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And some of us may be in other places. So go ahead and tell us where you are. It's just fun to see what city we're in. OK, I see Grapevine, Arlington. I'm in Bedford, Irving, Dallas, Arlington. Dr. Brown's in Roanoke. OK, wonderful. It's good to see our diversity of where we are, even if we're just in the Metroplex. And Dr. Smith is conveniently in his recliner. Great. So we're all over. And it's convenient that we can come together in this way in Waxahachie. OK, welcome, everyone. Let's take a poll. Where are you in your teaching career? We're always curious to know who our audience is. So you can go ahead and use the polling feature. It's in the participants window next to the hand. So don't click the hand, but just to the right of it, you'll see a drop down. It's A, B, C, D, E. And so go ahead and click what applies to you. And we'll give you a minute to vote. So it's looking like most of us are pre-service teachers. We're curious to see if our, any of our grads join, are joining us. I'll give us a few more seconds to vote. OK, and we do have a first year teacher on here as well. OK, great. Thanks, everyone, for voting. Those were our results. So we've got uh, mostly, mostly pre-service teachers, some faculty. And then we also have a first year teacher. Great. 
Let's review from last time. I'm not going to read this entire thing, but what's important to know about our topic of students with autism is that it is, um, you know, it's characterized by different features. It's, it exists on a continuum. The characteristics of autism include social impairments, communication difficulties, and then also restricted, repetitive, and stereotype patterns of behavior. However, it exists on a continuum, so every child is unique. Every child presents with different strengths and attributes. Every child has different challenges. Every child responds differently to interventions. So we know this to be true about teaching, the uniqueness of children. And we know this to be true, too, about any type of syndrome or disorder is that it's different with each child. And so this link right here, which is in the Google Doc, also shares more information about autism spectrum disorder. And it's important to know it exists on a continuum or a spectrum. And also it impacts, it says experts estimate one out of 88 children one out of 88 children age 8 will have an autism spectrum disorder. We also know that students can have what is called high functioning um, autism or Asperger's syndrome. So that's another sort of feature. We're going to talk about a variety of topics. We'll focus specifically on technology as intervention. Um, technology can also be a type of assessment um, as well. And so we'd like you to type in the chat window or in the box using the fourth little button down that, with the A. Type what comes to mind when you consider technology and autism. We'll give, we'll give us all about a minute just to type on the slide or to type in the chat window. And we welcome any ideas you have. Just what comes to mind when you think of technology, for instance, robots. What do robots have to do with autism? I was surprised myself to learn how they can help. So just type whatever comes to mind. We'll be looking in the chat window. So I see a couple people typing ideas. Don't be afraid to type and share with us, even if it's, you know, you're, even if what you're thinking is you're not sure yet. We also hope you can type what you hope to learn in this session. So let's see what people are sharing. And then just hit enter after you've typed your thoughts. We're hoping by the end of this session you'll have new concrete ideas. OK, educational interactive games, yes. Interactive is, is exactly. So we'll, we'll find out ways technology can help interactivity. Actually, there's way more to learn about technology than we have time for in this webinar. So what we're hoping is that you can maybe jot down or take notes, however you're taking notes in a notebook or whatever you're taking notes on. We're hoping you can explore some of these ideas on your own. And Dr. Brown says the text tool is a little A on the sidebar. OK, any more thoughts? Provide assistance, yes. And we'll talk about the different levels of assistance. OK, good. Somebody's typed a thought in the slide. Autistic children typically interact better with technology than other people. We learned something from Dr. Popa, who Dr. Brown will share just a bit more what we learned about students with autism and how they interact with technology. OK, great. OK, let's go ahead and see if anyone else has any more ideas. I see a couple people typing. So when we say technology, it can be something as simple as a picture. It doesn't have to be something plugged in. OK, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and click forward. I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Dan Popa. He was not able to join us today. However, we'll be sharing his ideas. And we have some videos that represent what he's thinking. We actually went and spoke with him. And the video is something you can, we can all learn from. So 
Um, Dr. Brown, are you there? I'll turn this over to you after this slide. So Dr. Popa is presently an associate professor with the Electrical Engineering Department at UT Arlington, and he's head of the Next Generation Systems Research Group. And he's also affiliated with the UT Arlington Research Institute, and his bio is there. So I'll um, turn it over to Dr. Brown. Hi. Um, I was really excited to meet Dr. Popa. We went to his lab to interview him. and. We have the video, and here's just a few quotes that that he said that we thought was really, really interesting. Um, but it's more than just seeing how autistic children will react with the robot. He said that um, eventually they want to be able to customize the robots to fit the needs of individual children, so they could kind of have their own robot um, to interact with. And um, kind of a side note, there was a, another robot, that Android, that was there that um, was very lifelike looking. He actually was re, uh, designed to look like Philip K. Dick, the one who wrote um, the 2001 Space Odyssey books. And um, when Dr. Simmingson walked in, she actually was started to talk to him thinking he was real. So that's how um, true yeah. it was. He was that um, realistic. So, um, but Zeno, as you'll see in a minute, is meant to look more, um, a little more cartoonish. I don't know if that's a good way to put it, but uh, to to help children learn to identify facial recognition and, and imitation. So, do we want to? Yeah, he's only about two feet tall. He was yeah, two feet. not quite as intimidating as the life size robot was. <laughs> um, all right, so the video, what we're going to do is show you uh, the video on the screen, and we will go ahead and, uh, Dr. Simmingson, can you copy and paste sure. that into the link? Yes. The chat, so in case it doesn't work well for somebody. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, um, if you're on a mobile device, if, if the video is about five minutes, so if you're on a mobile device, like I think Alex's and maybe Pete, you can watch the video on your own, and then you will have to rejoin us. Everyone else can see it on their screen live. So here we go. Just give us a green check um, if you can see it and hear it. Professor of Electrical Engineering at the University of Texas at Arlington.
Okay, I think we're back to the PowerPoint. All right, so it was kind of hard to tell in that demonstration that basically one of the, um, the purposes of that test is to see how well the child could imitate um, the behavior of the robot. And they can, by telling how well they imitate, they can actually kind of put a, a numerical figure on the severity of the autistic condition. Um, yeah, they didn't have the facial recognition uh, hooked up. They were just doing the body movements. But um, we have another, a couple of other videos that show a little bit more detail of Zeno interacting with an actual child. This is actually Dr. Popa's child, so he gave us permission to, oh, okay. to show this video. Um, okay. So if we want to go ahead and look at these two videos, and yeah. again, we'll post them in the, the link in the dis chat section in case you're not able to see the This one's video. real short. Yeah. This is actually Dr. Popa's child that he's interacting with. All right, and you can see through the little sensor nodules that they had on the little suit that the guy with, little guy was wearing, um, they can track through the video his movements to see how well he was able to replicate um, Zeno's movement. And then the next video is about the facial tracking specifically, so we'll get that video posted. Kind of interesting the when when the back is exposed, <laughs> you can see the wires. Okay. All right. So, like you said, it's um, 
they're using this not only to as a treatment for children with autism as treatment, what I mean is an intervention that will help them learn to recognize different facial expressions and what those mean and uh, doing that in a robot and then eventually being able to do that with humans, um, but also to be able to kind of put a numerical quantitative measure on the severity of their autism. It's always just been based on observations, no, no real um, actual data or numbers to associate with that. So that was where a couple of things we learned about Zeno and the work that Dr. Popa is doing. Um, as far as I understand, his exhibit is still on display at the Fort Worth Museum of Science History as well, if you happen to have time this break and want to go to go see that. All right, so so far, what do you think about Zeno? You can type some comments in the chat window. Um, you know, we were hoping that he could be here to answer questions, but being a Saturday right before a break, he wasn't able to do that. Um, but if you have specific questions, we can email him and get those answered for you and, and post them on our CNI Facebook page. Yeah, he, the facial expressions were really neat. Like I said, when we were in the lab with him, that part wasn't um, hooked up, but if you can imagine, you know, that when he, the demonstration, how unique that is. All right. Well, we, in addition to um, the facial expressions, um, I'm not sure with a complete repertoire that he could recognize, but I know that, um, you know, in working with children with autism, just being able to recognize when someone's happy or sad or surprised or angry, just, you know, depending on the age of the child, I'm sure it depends on what um, facial recognition that they're able to, to work with. Um, and speaking of other technologies, we, I don't know, Dr. Simmingston, if you want to do this slide or if you want me to, but. Sure, um, yeah. <laughs> I'll do the apps if you want to do these. Okay, great. Okay. okay, yeah, so of course we can't all have robots in our classrooms due to cost, um, but it's just really amazing the ways that robots can not just assess but instruct. And so Xenos would be considered an intervention. And so what we encourage you to do, as we said, we hope that you can learn more about Xeno. And if you just type in Dr. Dan Popa and the robot's name, Xeno, into the internet, there's a ton of press on him. And you can read some articles, um, sort of non-technical articles about that. And if you're writing about this for a class or something, I think it would be great to, to look further. And Dr. Smith says, what is the rationale or expectation? I think from what we've read and from what we've learned from talking to Dr. Popa is that the robot is non-threatening. Um, and that's sort of a key point. And so, the robot is sort of neutral in, in that he can help the student to learn to mimic um, the facial expressions. And he, he really said that, you know, the, the ability to imitate is really important for students with autism. So you can train students to imitate um, so that they will improve their skills and in social interaction. So it primarily has to do with that empathy. So recognizing emotion and conveying emotion. And so the robot is a sort of neutral, neutral in that regard, so non-threatening, as Dr. Popa said. Um, as well, the students are able to interact with Zeno in, in interesting ways. And so we'll continue to learn more about this topic. So some more sort of um, low budget ideas is using something as ubiquitous as an iPad. Um, but there's really some categories of assistive technology. Assistive technology, you can think of even like a pen or a piece of paper as technology. So some low sort of technology, low tech ideas would be visual cues. So we talked last time about using pictures, right? So having students that are less verbal pointing to things to express their needs. And that's commonly used. And I think Dr. Brown shared about a specific and widely used tool. And I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Can you remind us, Dr. Brown? It's called PEX, P-E-C-S, um, but it's like the Picture Enhanced Communication System. And so, uh -huh. um, like I said, it's a really widely used tool. 
actually, when I say widely used, I think it's it is being replaced with apps and iPads um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because those are becoming um, so prevalent. But that's kind of been the the go to. But it's basically a picture of something. Um, and the child learns to point to the picture to communicate their needs and wants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's so many, uh, I think special education has always been ahead of the curve with, with technology use to enhance instruction um, or to help with intervention. And so there's just a ton out there. We'll touch on a few. Did you want to add anything else about visuals? Um, visuals are also you know, like a vi we talked last time about the visual schedules, the visual calendars to help um, remind students of what their schedule is for that day. Um, children with autism really thrive with routine. And if something is going to be out of the routine, they need a lot of preparation to kind of gently ease them into it instead of an abrupt um, schedule change that, oh, no, we're not doing that. Now we're we're going to, you know, it's it's raining outside. We're not going outside. We have to do something else. They need a little more um, coaxing into that. And so having a visual schedule where you can interchange um, activities, it, it helps them know what to follow. Um, voice and output audio reminders, just little things like having, you know, an alarm on a phone, like, uh, I mean, you know, having a little sound come up on their phone when it's time for them to, you know, at the end of TV time, maybe if they have so much, you know, an hour of TV time in the evening and the parent doesn't want to um, have a big fight about if TV time's over, they can set an alarm and just a little beep comes up and says, oh, you know, it's time for your TV time to be over, and it kind of helps them. So different things like that. And then, like I said, there's we're going to look here in a second at different um, other technologies that are really helpful. So go ahead and Good. yeah. Oh, I was just going to add too, um, real quick. Videos can be watched more than once. I actually like to watch yes. videos more than once, so they can help with modeling, and we'll talk about that too. All right. So different assistive technologies can also help when you're actually. Um, you know, working with children to help them with their literacy and language skills. So having books that are larger print, so there's not as much distraction on the page, having talking books and audio books are very helpful um, because they can, often children with autism, they may not be able to verbally communicate their needs and wants, but they understand. They have very high receptive language. So they understand what's being said to them and being read to them. They just don't necessarily have the ability to communicate or expressive language. So audiobooks, um, different organizational tools, sorry, I'm sorry, and um, concept maps. Um, so things like that, different voice recognition, speech, having keyboards so that they don't have to actually, um, you know, handwriting is sometimes more difficult than typing. And you can have a child that's very uh, fluent typing but doesn't have very good handwriting skills. So those are all, those have been used. There's actually, um, in high schools, this was even before they had a lot of iPads and things, they had keyboards that they would just take the keyboard with them, type, and then go to their special education room, plug it in, and it would print up the notes that they had typed. So this has been around for quite a while for kids with autism. All right. This is an example of a concept map. Um, this is one from Poplet that Dr. Um, Simmingson found. But any type of concept map that helps um, put the words and visual into a visual format. Children with autism tend to be very visual, and they can organize information in their brains better visually than with just like a written outline or something like that. And you can create these using um, you know, just drawing them yourself, or you, there's a lot the technology like Poplet that can help create those. All right, and then I have a couple of, 
Hold on, I want to see when I get to the to this one. We'll come back if we have time. Um, I have a couple of screens that I'm going to share with you about some different apps that. Sorry, I can't talk and share my screen at the same time. Apparently. All right. There we go. All right. So this is. An app. What a, what ABA means is it's talking about um, a specific behavior intervention um, technique that is used a lot with children um, with autism. This is one that is it's available for 99 cents in iTunes, so it's very inexpensive. And I just have the screenshot or the yeah, I didn't actually download it, but you can see here that you can have them play different games and identify different things in the game. So here's one where they're, you know, identifying different foods and they may be doing color, like which one is not red. And they can point to the one that's not red. And then here's one where it puts the picture with the word. So you can have them start associating the pictures and words together. And then at the end it will give you a um, print out of the task that they've mastered where they need more help and um, you know where they can go back and work. So it's something that they can do to help with their their vocabulary, but it also is very interactive. And like I said, it has um, I was trying to see if it had anything more demos, but it doesn't. We also have just flashcards for the applied behavior analysis. And these can be downloaded for free as a flashcard, or they also have iPad apps where you can have these flashcards. So you can see that you have specific flashcards. You have conversation scripts that you can download, um, ideas for sequencing, categor categorizing. Here's some for emotions. We talked about how it's difficult for children with autism to recognize emotion. And so doing it with a card and teaching them those explicitly and having them practice and imitate, like what Zena is doing, but in a much more low-tech uh, manner. And then the next one I found that I want to show you is actually a calendar tool. And you can have them place icons of what's going to be happening on different days, maybe if there's a special event happening. And, and so it's just a visual, a way to create a visual calendar for a child with autism. And it has lots of different icons. Here's some of the icon choices that you can use. And you can type your name and type um, a description of the item in there as well. So like I said, instead of having to print out the pictures and make a visual calendar, there's a lot of different choices for doing that with um, with iPads. And those are just a few. You can find just, I don't even know, unlimited <laughs> numbers of, we kind of go back out of the screen sharing now. Hold on. Um, just unlimited numbers of different types of of iPad apps. All right. Sorry, I'm trying to get out of the screen sharing really quick. All right. There we go. And I added those to the Google Doc. Yes. Generally, it's a follow-up. Um, this site here, the Autism Speaks website, they have a list of assistive technology that is very exclusive. I mean, inclusive. It has a lot of different information. Um, so if you have a child in your classroom that's struggling in a specific area and you want to you know, look up some different assistive technologies to specifically address that, like maybe, you know, they're having a hard time um, communicating. They're having a hard time 
following the schedule, they're having a hard time, you know, in interacting in, in group time, things like that. So um, this is a great resource. And like I said, there's probably, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 different links on this, on this web page. So it's just a, a general overview of all of the different iPhone apps, any kind of technology that will work. Oh, I forgot to do the puffer-shaped one. Anyway, but there's a lot of different, you can use these different um, iPhone apps. But like I said, you just Google iPhone apps for autism, and you will get lots and lots of different ideas. Thanks, Dr. Right, anything Brown. Anything else about the apps that you want to talk about? Um, no, I think the best thing to do for for you guys, since you're most of you are uh, new teachers, I, and you probably do this anyway, is I would say if you have an iPad or someone else's iPad, um, you know, just go ahead and download the app and play with it, so you can kind of see what it's like, um, and then go through it and just try it out. So especially with the free apps. So I think that's even what the I would ones recommend. that are free are are really inexpensive, like. 99 cents, a dollar mm -hmm. 99. Um, I think that they've done a good job of making them accessible, price-wise, and not, um, you know, making them too exp too expensive for just anyone to be able to to download. Yeah, and then one more idea is just talk to talk to teachers that have experience working with students with autism and ask them what tools they recommend, what works well. All right, so I think to wrap up for today, we wanted to, um, I was just going to give a, a real quick overview of my impressions of the book that we read together. Um, I'm not sure how many people were able to finish the entire book. I actually finished it on our trip that we just got, we, Dr. Simic and I just got back from. And so, um, one of the things that Temple Grandin in this book really talks about is how we have the, the leaps we've made in diagnosing and recognizing autism. She gives a really good explanation of why the instances of autism appear to be more prevalent when it's actually um, the diagnosis criteria has become more fine-tuned. So she, you know, explains how that worked and she goes into using different technologies like MRIs, functional MRIs, um, even genetic, um, looking for different genes responsible and, and hereditary and environmental um, contributors to autism and things like that, which, by the way, she does give a really good explanation on why, uh, you know, giving their, your child their their shots, their immunizations is not going to necessarily give them autism. So uh, that seems to be like a really still prevalent uh, misconception. Um, but one of my favorite examples from the book is she talks about how, you know, learning how the brain works and learning why different brain-based, um, you know, differences occur we are just, you know, scratching the surface, and she explains how, like, if we sent a PC with a flash drive back 100 years and the best scientists in the world worked on it, she said even if we sent 100 so they could, you know, tear them open and things like that, they still wouldn't be able to completely grasp how that flash drive was containing information and what a chip was and things like that because they just didn't have the frame of reference. They didn't have the background knowledge necessary at that time to understand that. And so um, our understanding of how the brain works and especially with different um, things like autism is in such an infancy state that in 100 years we'll be able to look back and think, oh, I can't believe they once thought that, you know. So anyway, the other point that she really um, focuses on is that she always thought her brain was broken. If something was wrong with her, her brain was broken. And what she found out through different scans and learning um, how to 
uh, function in different situations is that her brain isn't broken, it's just highly specialized. And hers is highly specialized in the visual cortex, which means she thinks in pictures and she can, you mention a word to her and she can just come up with, you know, a hundred pictures to represent that word in her brain and she can also see how, like put a movie together in her mind of, you know, how something's going to play out and that's how she's able to, you know, do some of the work that she does. So kids with autism can have really exceptional and unique contributions to society. They're just, their brain isn't going to work like everyone else's. It's very specialized in a certain area. Um, she, one of her biggest uh, praises that she gives is to her mother who, you know, before anyone really understood about how to enter different interventions with autism, she said her mother used, was very good at learning to stretch her outside of her comfort zone so that if autistic children are scaffolded properly and they're given support to gradually um, do things that they aren't as comfortable with in a gradual way and in just the right way, they can be very successful. Um, and then the final thing that she wanted to mention and where a lot of her work with autism is heading is sensory issues. And she just explained that understanding that a sensory issue isn't, you know, just something they're making up, it, it really is something that creates fear for them. And she mentioned um, how if she hears people talking under the, win you know, in, under the window of her apartment at night, she knows that they're not going, you know, they're just some students talking. She lives on campus, like her close to the campus where she works. And in her logical part of her, she knows that it's fine, nothing's going to happen. But she becomes overwhelmed with fear of, you know, someone breaking in because she can hear them talking. And it's just a constant battle with, with that fear. And, um, in the HBO movie, yeah. she talks about being scared of doors, and especially like automatic doors. And it was just an overwhelming fear and a paralyzing fear for her. And so that it is real and the helping them, like I said, come with ways to overcome those can reduce the amount of like meltdowns and things like that that you're having in your classroom. So I know Dr. Simmingson read another great book by by Temple Grandin, and there's actually a really good TED Talk related to this video, to this book as well. So did you want to? Oh, good. Sure. So this is Thinking in Pictures. And I don't know if you all knew this, but Temple Grandin, she's an animal scientist professor in Colorado, I believe. She has designed one-third of all the livestock handling facilities in the United States. And she actually kind of got the perspective not not literally of the cows, but she took on their point of view, um, and she loves animals, and she used her insights into that to to really be a gifted inventor, um, an innovator in her field. And it says she also widely she lectures widely on autism, and I'm just going to read something from the preface by Oliver Sacks. And it says, the word autism still conveys a fixed and dreadful meaning to most people. They visualize a child mute, rocking, screaming, inaccessible, cut off from human contact. And we almost always speak of autistic children, never of autistic adults, as if such children never grew up or were somehow mysteriously spirited off the planet out of society. And I think what this, the importance of her work is to, to illustrate that perspective from an adult, you know, who has grown up with autism and, and her perspective. And then he concludes the preface by saying, Temple does not romanticize autism, nor does she downplay how much her autism has cut her off from the social world, the pleasures, rewards, companionships that for the rest of us may define much of life. But she has a strong, positive sense of her own being and worth and how autism paradoxically may have contributed contributed to this. At a recent lecture, she ended by saying, if I could snap my fingers and be non-autistic, I would not, because then I wouldn't be me. Autism is part of who I am. And so like Dr. Brown was saying, she she um, talks about 
the strengths that she has in terms of how she sees the world. And I think that's the beauty of her books. And so we recommend them. Um, we do have a book club on Goodreads, which we'll leave open. And if you want to join that, we'll put the link here as a reminder. And we'll post about it on the Facebook page that we have. And we'll also try to post some quotes on the Facebook page, too, since that might be easier for people. But just some final thoughts. Tell us what you think about these. Build on students' strengths. Teach students to self-advocate. Um, learn to help students do what works for them, whether it's technology, whether it's high tech or low tech, like we talked about. Help students to become aware of what works for them. And then just a few more tips. Breaking up tasks for them really helps. And then multi-sensory aids, mo uh, many of which we shared today, involve technology. Um, so what are your thoughts? Tell us, everyone type something in the chat window. What's kind of an idea that you gleaned from today? Anything that we talked about? Let's see what people are thinking so far. So something you hope to explore further, whether it's the robotics ideas we talked about, whether you hope to learn more about iPad apps, or maybe you want to learn more, read the book by Temple Grandin. It's probably on a Kindle version, too, if you like to read that way. So just tell us something you learned today. Or a question. We'll give you guys a minute. OK, good. Play with some of the apps. Me too. There's so many. Autistic children respond well to robots and non-human technology. And I found it interesting that after age 15, there's no difference between how autist students with autism and students without autism interact with technology. And there's a yeah, the apps app. are really interesting. Yeah. yeah, like I said, there was I picked you know three or four to show today, but when I just Googled iPad apps for autistic, you know, for autism, there were hundreds of hits that came up. So it's something that um, you know that we definitely have a lot of resources out there to take advantage of as teachers. OK, great. Well, we want to thank you for attending. Building on the idea of the brain and, and brain-based learning, so to speak, we do have a master's degree in mind, brain, and education. And the contact for that is Dr. Mark Schwartz. So if you're interested in coming back to UT Arlington for an interesting master's degree program, it's unique. Um, you can contact Dr. Mark Schwartz at Schwarm a at uta.edu. And I'll let you wrap up the last two slides, Dr. Brown. All right. Um, we want to learn more about how you feel about the webinars, what you're learning from them, and also just how we can improve them for the future. We are planning to do um, additional webinars in the spring. We're thinking of the topic of behavior in classroom management, but not just your typical run-of-the-mill behavior. We're thinking of, you know, like, what do you do with different severe instances of behavior? Um, I think that's one of the uh, things that you're not as prepared for maybe your first few years of teaching of how you deal with with those types of behaviors. So that's our idea for the spring. But we want to learn more about what you think. So we have developed a survey. And I checked the link before beginning the, survey, the webinar today. So it does work this time. Um, but if you could follow this link and just take this really short survey, it would really help us in improving um, how we present the webinars, when we present them, what topics we're doing, things like that. And we can learn more so that we can better help you and support you as you're um, learning to be a teacher and your journey as a teacher. That's what we want these webinars to do. So if you could please um, follow the link and do that. It just takes a few minutes. It's really short. And we would love it. Thank you. Yeah, classroom management seemed 
to be a really popular topic when we were asking students what they were interested in. So we wanted to, to do that in the spring. That's our plan. All right, anything else that you want to wrap up with, Dr. Simmingson? We actually finished early for once. Yeah, um, thanks, everyone. <laughs> Tell us a word or a phrase that stood out to you as, as your final thought today, and then we'll just say our departures. But we do encourage you to do the survey. The link is in the chat window. Just let us know a word or phrase or a topic that stood out to you today. All right, that's a great quote. I love that autism is a part of who I am. I like yeah, that I like one that. too. Yeah, that's profound. And if you, I know that finals are coming up soon and everyone's really busy, but just watching her TED Talks, she is an amazing person. I could sit and watch them. She's done several, and I just one day sat and watched several in a row, and I just really admire her. She's an amazing person. So it's very interesting. All right. Well, thank you again for being here. Yeah, the brain isn't broken. I love that quote. That she's just specialized. <laughs> That's how she put it.